Welcome back to Keeping the World Company. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have here our esteemed guest, uh, Gene Rosenfeld, and my co-host, Tim Apicella, uh, for a discussion of balancing uh, what happened on October 7th um, with, um, with all the protests around the world now we have. Um, so welcome to the show, Gene, Tim. This is an important discussion. Uh, let me start it off by playing a piece from the uh, BBC. BBC has been criticized, as other um, other news cable news networks, for um, being in, being partial and in favor of the Palestinians and not even talking about what happened on October seventh. Here's a, here's a clip that I think is demonstrative. Article 43, basic rule, the parties to the conflict shall confine their operations to the destruction or weakening of the military resources of the adversary and shall make a distinction between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives. So I that's come back exactly what we're doing. That's exactly why we are allowing the c civilians to evacuate before pounding them. We're doing but the it, opposite. It's not exactly what, what you're doing. No, uh, it's wait, not you, exactly asked, you asked the question. Would you let me answer? Go ahead. What Hamas, ISIS did is they entered roughly 30 communities. Whenever they can, they butchered babies. They burnt them alive. They pulled a, a baby out of a pregnant mom's and, and then beheaded the baby, beheaded the mom. They raped young girls. This is what we're dealing with. And with all due respect, I think that Geneva Conventions, first and foremost, tell a country, you need to defend yourself, and we will defend ourselves. We're going out of our way. I know that uh, last week a hospital was uh, uh, fired by Islamic Jihad that, that fired a rocket on it, and BBC said that it was Israel, but it wasn't Israel. And I understand that BBC has taken a side of, uh, uh, on the Gazan side, because all your questions are only about the Gazan civilians. That's not you true. You haven't asked one that's question. That's not true. You haven't true. asked one question I, I began about by those children. That, from the very beginning of this interview, from you the very just are asking me about them. Mr. But Bennett, it seems that, that is you not true. little about our side. Oh, it is. Mr. What Bennett, I began, I, began, about our side? I began by talking about the hostages. And what I'm asking you about now is... No, I'm not talking is, about the hostages. I'm talking about the babies that were murdered. And you keep on caring only about one side, but that is the BBC way. But uh, let me let me tell you something. We're here protecting you. You're, we don't need your protection. And if you think there's a, a balance here between two equal sides, then you are lacking moral clarity. And BBC, I must say, is lacking moral clarity. What you guys did last week, shame on you. It's hard to understand what's going on. Um, you know, there was an article in RS this morning trying to understand why um, people in the in the liberal center of Manhattan, in Washington Square Park, which is across the street from my alma mater law school, NYU, uh, were there in great numbers tearing down photographs uh, of the hostages. This is not the first time we've seen news articles about this. This particular article, which I'll post on our site, uh, was really troubling in the sense that they try to figure out why people would do that. There was no good answer, let me, let me say. Um, the other thing that happened in New York, which was uh, national headlines, was that a bunch of Jewish students were barricaded uh, in, a, in a room, in a, some kind of um, uh, hard-to-access room uh, in Cooper Union, a few blocks away from NYU, um, by people who were protesting in favor of Hamas. Uh, and they were really frightened, and the security people told them, you better lock yourself in that room. And I, for all I know, they're still there um, with the threats of violence. And finally, and I'm sure there's more in the paper, uh, finally there was a, uh, an Israeli, uh, American-Israeli uh, artist uh, who has who's been receiving death threats. Uh, why? Because she's an Israeli, that's why. And it lives in the United States. So what, what we have is, a, uh, is the liberal end gone wild. And it's happening in the United States in, in significant uh, measure, and it's happening all over the world. Uh, so, Tim, let me ask you first, your reaction to what's going on? Uh, well, it's, my reaction is it's a battle for hearts and minds of, 
not only the American public, but for the world 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 opinion. And um, I, you know, I'm still trying to get over last week's reporting from the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, the New York Times. They get an F minus in their reporting. That's, I, if my opinion, it was irresponsible journalists to basically get uh, their set of the other side of the story, their facts from a terrorist organization an ISIS-like organization, and yet they're trying to get the, the true, fair um, representation of the other side's opinion of what's going on. I'm sorry, you don't interview terrorist organizations and put it on the front page of the New York Times. You don't put it as the, the, cap, the first you know, five minutes of your news cycle on, on MSNBC, CNN, and the like. Um, F minus. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gene, let's talk about the newspaper for a minute. There was an article, what, by Emiliani Trask. You responded uh, and you sent your article in, which we will post, post also on our website. Can you talk about the exchange of articles? Well, on October 24th, the Star Advertiser published one side, one narrative, the Palestinian narrative, which was adopted by a Hawaiian activist, very well known, Mililani Trask, who has been for Hawaiian. Um, independence, sovereignty, self-determination, which are good things for a long, long time. But unfortunately, what it shows me is that we have to combat one aspect of this narrative that is going around the world and stimulating so much misunderstanding and inflammatory reactions. I call this rhetorical inflammation it's syndrome. And this particular part of, of the narrative is framing it as the colonialists and the colonized. Israel was not colonized by the Jews. The Jews are the indigenous people of the land, as well as the so-called Palestinians who are there. You know, the word Palestine, the province of Palestine, is a very late name that the Ottoman Empire gave to that part of its empire. That land has been called Judea. It's been called um, Israel, it's been called Canaan, it's been called uh, the land of the Philistines over many years. But if you read the history, you will see that the Jews are the indigenous people of the land. They have never left the land. The last time they were deported en masse from the land was by the Ottomans uh, before uh, the British mandate after World War I, when the Allied powers took control under Britain's mandate from the League of Nations, who partitioned that part of the Ottoman Empire between two indigenous people of the land. They are now called the Palestinians and the Jews. These are not people who are even racially that distinct. They are genetic cousins. So to frame this as apartheid, as if it were a racial divide, is another falsehood that this narrative, this Palestinian narrative that's going around the world and um, basically empowered by Hamas, uh, we have to just get back to the facts here. Yes, well, what, what, did, what did your article cover? Was it that or was it uh, more? Jay, my article, if you're, Referring to the uh, letter I sent to the editor of the newspaper here in Hawaii was only giving her uh, a summary of what I did in my quick study of the history of this land. Yes, I've followed it all my life, and it's been a very long life, but I also went back and did a quick study and shared it with people that I felt would appreciate just getting some facts. Mm -hmm. You sent you sent to Lucy Oda. I did, yes, mm -hmm. and she's been she's been very good. She's been very kind. So and we're I here. To, we're here to balance, okay? We're here to balance, and um, or at least to examine the possibility of balance. On the one hand, you have what that Israeli was saying about about the uh, war crimes and atrocities, which uh, you know sticks in your head, at least in mine. And um, on the other hand, you're talking about this uh, worldwide uh, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic movement um, that is that is fed by um, you know the the media, which Tim was talking about. At the same time, uh, Hamas is still firing rockets into into Israel, and they're trying to catch all parts of Israel, not just the south. You know, they're trying to uh, 
you know, send them into uh, Tel Aviv, even Haifa. And um, so what you have is a continuing effort by Hamas. Secondly, you have, you have the misinformation, the misinformation about, um, you know, about, about the event itself. Um, Hamas published on what it had done minutes after it started doing it and, and on October 7th. And, you know, and, and of course, it was biased. And, and, um, and what, what strikes me, what is clear and what has been written is that they had this all worked out. They had their PR campaign worked out just the way they had their death squad uh, arrangement worked out. Same thing. And uh, it's, it's part of the war. Um, you have a, a two front, three front, four front, maybe a five front war, including the uh, Red Sea. And, um, it, you know, it's still going on. Uh, you have the hostages there, and something over 200 hostages that are still in captivity. Um, so, you know, Hamas is alive and well. And you can say that the Israelis are trying to root them out in small pieces, but the fact is that Joe Biden doesn't want them to do a ground war. He's made it clear, and it has had an effect on Israeli strategy. Um, but my question is, how do, you, how do you balance this? It all seems so totally unfair. Tim? Well, Jay, remember in, in previous programs, we talked about warfare, um, kinetic and non-kinetic. Uh, we are now dealing with a phase of this war uh, that is the non-kinetic. It's the, as I said, it's the reach for hearts and minds. It's the, it's the propaganda efforts uh, from Hamas. And, and I didn't finish what I wanted to say when I, on the opener was that, did you hear any sense of apology or retraction or admission from CNN, BBC, MSNBC, uh, that they got it wrong. They basically, on the headlines, accused Israel of hitting that hospital, killing 300. Uh, and they said, we did responsible journalism. We, we did our responsible reporting by contacting our source. We got our source. Well, what was the source? Spokespeople for Hamas. Give me a break. So here you had bad reporting that basically canceled a very crucial meeting of potential allies in the region, uh, Egypt, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. That meeting was canceled at the, you know, right in front of uh, Joe Biden's eyes. Uh, he was basically holding his hat in hand going, now what do I do? So he went and talked to Israel, of course. But uh, what, what, a, what a disaster that was. And, and who would he have to thank for that? Uh, irresponsible reporting from the major news agencies. So. Um, let me just stop right there because um, that is a crucial part of what the today's topic is, and that is where is the media going with this slanted, flawed reporting? Now, do they have the right to talk about the you know the Palestinians trying to leave the you know uh, northern Gaza? Yes, they have the right to talk about that. Do they have the right to talk about shortage of food and, and water? Yes, they have the right to talk about that. Do they have the right to talk about what the genesis is of those shortages? You bet they have the right to talk about it. Are they? Not as much. Mm, couple, couple of thoughts. Uh, as much as I admire the Times, um, they did publish a kind of apology for bad reporting. I didn't see it, so I'm glad you're bringing it up. It's a, it was very mm, soft soap. And the um, you know, first paragraph said well, we were wrong, and the rest of it um, was not an apology at all. Um, have you heard BBC, anything from CNN, BBC, MSNBC? B BBC, I understand, uh, fired six journalists who they felt were being unfair on the subject yesterday. Um, so, you know, there is some reaction to the reaction. I mean, there, there has been reaction, just as your reaction, and this has had some effect, although I think it's really a minimal effect, because if you look at the media today, you see pretty much the same thing. And what, and what is really sad about this is that they know, we know, everyone knows that Hamas is lying. Hamas is lying about what happened in that parking lot outside the hospital. Hamas is lying about the number of people who were injured or killed. Um, that number changed about five times, uh, and any reasonable reporter would have looked for verification elsewhere and would have noticed that the number changed five times. Um, they are not to be trusted. Yesterday, uh, the Israelis pointed out that, um, that Hamas, according to their intelligence, has a million, not gallons, but kilos of fuel in reserve. 
to light their tunnels, a million, and they're not sharing that with the hospitals or anybody. So when you hear about these preemies dying in the crib for lack of fuel, that is pretty much a crock because uh, Hamas has the fuel. Um, and so anyway, what, what we have is lies yeah, coming out. Yeah, go Let ahead. me just ask this quick question. To our memories, how often was ISIS consulted for their facts and their side of the story? Not much. Uh, I don't see this any different. I, I, I hate to say it, there's a comparison between Hamas and ISIS. They're one and the same, and particularly in the brutal attack of the, the kibbutz. Uh, in some ways, they're worse than ISIS. Well, if they're going to kill mothers and babies and all the things they've done, horrible, horrible, unspeakable things they've done, you think they're into telling the truth? Do you think there's a, a, a moral fiber there? <laughs> Let me go to what, you. What Gene. would prompt a journalist to even approach them for the facts? I, that's what I don't understand, and I'm, I'm flummoxed. It's, by it's that press thought. releases, Tim. They released this information, and the press, you know, true to its capitalistic uh, motivations, wants raw meat news. This happens in this country all the time. That's why Trump can always get on the headlines. Well, that's and lazy so journalism. It's a, it's a kind of journalism we haven't seen before. Uh, it's, it's a journalism of fools is what it is. Well, it's lazy. They, they don't have time to check out the facts. Yeah. So, Gene, your, your thoughts about this. I, I know you would like to see a balance, but can there be a balance? You remember what uh, Golda Meir said? Uh, she said, you can never negotiate for peace with someone who is dedicated to killing you. Uh, it was, I think it's just as true today as it was then. And I'll take it one step further with Tim is saying that this is that what the Israelis are doing is part of defending themselves against the repetition of exactly the same thing. That's the way they see it. Um, and indeed, it would seem to me, and, and this is, um, you know, um, based on what the Palestinians and the Hamas and the Hezbollah have done in the past is, you give them something, you know, they demand something, you give them something, and then you repeat the conduct. Um, and so, it, you know, it would seem to me, and I'll make a wager on this if anybody's interested, um, that, it, you know, if you gave them a concession, they would happily take the concession, um, negotiate for something, and then break the deal and, and repeat the, the evil conduct. So anyway, Gene, what, how do you feel about balancing this? Can it be balanced? First and foremost, we have to understand that this is a multi-front war and this is a hybrid war. And it is, in a sense, even larger than a Middle East war. That one of the purposes of Hamas is to score propaganda points globally and to realign nations that are important nations like Turkey toward their cause. And it is also uh, in, involving the United States, Iran's paramilitaries have been launching attacks on American bases in Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Joe Biden, it seems, and Tom Friedman, who writes for the New York Times, probably their most prestigious columnist, seem to agree that their approach toward Israel is to first and foremost Yes, affirm Israel's right to self-defense, and that is backed by UN and international court accords, as well as just war theology in Judaism and Christianity. So he affirms that Israel has the right to strike back and defend itself, but also he is holding the Israelis to the consideration and the promise of reigniting the two-state solution, not just normalization and putting the state as a Palestinian state on the back burner, but offering a two-state solution. And in a sense, this is a good counter to the Palestinian Hamas narrative that's false and is going around the world right now, because it gives the Palestinians something to hope for. And they need that. And the world needs that. In terms of moral clarity, there is no moral equivalence 
between the attack on the Israelis and what they carried out and how they did it. That is 13th century Al-Qaeda theology. And the Israeli response, which is based on Jewish just war and Christian just war concepts of evacuating civilians as much as possible, but defending because as the rabbi of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles recently wrote in an important article, the right of self-defense is essential to all peoples who want self-determination. If you do not take out an enemy who is dedicated to the extinction of your own people, then you are doomed historically to have to repeat again and again war against that enemy who's going to be attacking you and carrying out its genocidal objective. And let's be honest here. Hamas is a genocidal entity. The Palestinian people, we have to separate from Hamas. Nevertheless, they are also hostages to the people who rule them as well. Yeah, but so is uh, Hezbollah and so is Iran. They're all constitutionally dedicated to uh, wiping out the state of Israel and every Jew. It's extraordinary uh, how, how, how much hatred there is. And this is spreading. And even today, I understand, um, Mr. Erdogan, our favorite leader of Turkey, has come out in favor of Hamas. How about that potato? Uh, Tim, you wanted to say something. Well, it's more than just um, Iran's, you know, support uh, against Israel. Today, the foreign minister of Iran announced that the U.S. will not escape the fires if Israel doesn't stop, you know, this aggressive campaign against Hamas. Um, when I saw that um, in, on CNN today, I instantly thought, oh, my God, he's threatening another 9-11. Well, let me let me ask Gene for a moment. Gene, you know, there are those with all this insanity, and it really is insanity. There is no justification. Um, you know, you can say that they're looking for a two-state solution, which I don't feel should be discussed at all until this war is over. I, I don't think you want to, you know, discuss, discuss these kinds of negotiations uh, until the war is over. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> Uh, what what we have here is insanity, and people want to kill and they want to hate, including people in New York, you know, which is a bastion of Jewish society. Unbelievable, and and the protests are against the Jews, against against um, the Israelis. It's unbelievable. Um, but but going beyond that, looking at the United States position, its um, role in the Middle East with its carriers and destroyers and weapons and the like. No boots on the ground, but there's definitely a presence um, by, by Biden's uh, military. <clears throat> the, the problem I see is that this is spreading, despite our wishes to the contrary, despite our hopes and dreams that it will be, that it will stop. It's not stopping. Um, and it's, it seems to be expanding every day. You look at the news and say, my God, there's something else happening here in some other country with some other, you know, crowd or people want to kill um, and so forth. And I, uh, in, including this country, and I'm saying, uh, Gene, are we in World War III now? Yes, I'm a historian, not a journalist. And I have said for some time that we are in a hybrid World War III or the run-up to it. I've analogized it to 1938, 1939. But this war will not be fought in the same way as World War II. Uh, it will be fought with different types of weapons. It will be fought as much in the PR and internet uh, battlefields, even more so what we call information warfare, um, is a force multiplier in this world today as technologically sophisticated as it is, um, there will be even less separation between civilians and military targets because the uh, way in which the um, what I consider to be the other side <laughs> is fighting 
is utilizing terroristic tactics. We've just been through what's called the war on terror, and some people have criticized that nomenclature, but basically we've endured a, a fourth wave of religious terrorism in the modern world globally. And it is now subsiding into a run-up to an intense polarization between uh, Russia on the one hand and the United States on the other, and their associated powers and allies and objectives. And as I've said before, Putin has a very clear vision about dispossessing Western influence and utilizing the propaganda war as much as possible to stir up chaos within states like the United States and also throughout the world. And what is a bigger tinderbox in the world than the Middle East? For 70 some years, people have dreaded in the United States, statesmen have dreaded that the Middle East would flare up into a tinderbox. And this, and what Joe Biden is doing by sending our carrier groups and our military people to that area is trying to prevent a wider war. Um, Iran is not a significant world power militarily or economically. It is aligned with Russia. It is, in a sense, an arm of Russia right now. But it is utilizing asymmetric warfare in the Middle East to create the kind of chaos and emotion that has set fire rhetorically to the world and in terms of protests, as well as kinetically, as Tim has noticed. The Israelis have been conducting low-level kinetic warfare in Gaza. They have been targeting senior officials of Hamas. They have been trying to find out where the hostages are. They have been targeting Hamas, and there have been over 16,000 civilian casualties. Now, that number is not a firm number because we don't have good reporting from Gaza. Nevertheless, despite that, Israel has to defend itself. It didn't ask for this war. Let's focus, let's turn the cameras around, media, and let's focus on the people who started this war. Let's focus on Hamas and what they did and what they're doing now, hiding from, their, from, from, uh, from retribution and justice behind their own people whose lives they do not value. So there is no moral equivalence. And those in the United States, in our intellectual centers like New York City, we have failed to educate a couple of generations about fascism and about the consequences of world war. Yes, I think we are in World War III, I do. And I think we have to not lose sight of Ukraine either because it's all part and parcel of the same thing. So Jean, I wanna ask you a completely unfair question, especially in, in, in view of your reluctance to be a prognosticator. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what should we do? How can we avoid the expansion of this, um, the the increase in violence, the increase in in players. What can we do? Let's let's say that we we had political will, which is not clear. Let's say we had political will and we could uh, implement whatever plan we came up with. Let's assume that for this discussion. What should we do? First and foremost, journalists by and large in the major news outlets in the United States are very intelligent and well-educated people, but they need to do a quick study like I've been doing as well in being able to separate out the strands of the data that's coming across their desks. And they need to get back to journalistic practice, which is when you hear both sides of the story, go to the window and see what's looking out, what, what it looks like outside. Go there, find out on the ground. They're doing that, it's very dangerous and it needs to be done. So the media has to reform itself and not take sides. It, and secondly, I think that the United States needs to get its political house in order. I don't think we can wait on this. I think we have to somehow 
with our three branches of government figure out how to, I don't know exactly the right word, I don't want to say fight against, but prevent our own terror, political terrorists from taking over control of our democratic system. And thirdly, I think that right now the administration is doing what it can do, militarily, politically, and in terms of trying to prevent a wider war, of trying to get the real story out, in trying to create conditions for peace and a lasting settlement in Gaza. Um, you know, it's like fires breaking out in climate change. Fires are now breaking out geopolitically. And I think this administration at least has a handle on things, has a view of what's going on, is aware of what Russia is doing, what Iran is doing, and how it is attempting to overthrow the Pax Americana that has kept the world relatively safe since World War II. And those of us who were alive during World War II, like Joe Biden, they know what a war is really like. This generation is shocked because this is the first time in Ukraine and Israel that they have seen what happened in World War II. The Holocaust, Dresden, Hiroshima, Normandy, Okinawa, these were incredible things and they weren't that long ago. We can't ever, ever forget. Well, <clears throat> Putin has called his um, group together and uh, they are now uh, voting on withdrawing from uh, all nuclear non-proliferation treaties. Another threat. Um, but but I think we have to add that to the list of possible horrors, um, a nuclear war. This could turn into that, thanks to him. But let me let me ask you, I mean, you, you suggest an examination of, you know, how things were in World War II. It's it's um, my old reference to Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol and the ghost of Christmas future. And uh, what would you tell Scrooge? What would you tell him is going to happen if we don't address this? We just continue going down the same path where very, I hate to say effective, alliances where state powers like Iran are using paramilitaries and asymmetrical organizations to carry out their bidding in order to escape direct retribution from the international uh, consortium of responsible nations. Um, as long as you're, you're, you're giving license to terrorists to carry out your bidding, um, there are going to be these terrible things. We forget, too, that, you know, Russia went into Chechnya and pacified it in two wars. But the reason why Russia did that is because they were suffering terrorist attacks in Russia. And we, we talk about China going after the Uyghurs and uh, pacifying that whole population in ways that we find repellent. But there were beginning to be terrorist uh, attacks in China. So terrorism has become a weapon of choice in a hybrid war. And our quote, what we've learned from our quote, war on terrorism, we can also apply to these entities. Um, and, and that takes in especially the message because terrorism is an act by a weaker group to send a message to a particular audience. Mm. And it's the message that can make the difference on the battlefield as well. It's a force multiplier, as I said. Mm -hmm. Well, terrorism, after a while, it gets to be ubiquitous. It gets to be chaos. It means the whole world is chaos. And I, I suggest we have to watch out for that because these indications are the, the winds of war, the winds of chaos. So, Tim, your thoughts about this? Um, we have a few minutes left and I would like to know well, how you feel about that, uh, We're in a hybrid war, World War III. I don't know we're in World War III. I don't know if I believe that quite yet, but I've certainly seen the, the move to it, and that is the alignment of allies. 
uh, China, North Korea, Iran, you know, uh, it, uh, you know, t- um, uh, excuse me, um, Belarus, Russia, you know, you see this alignment of the, of the autocratic states versus the uh, alignment of democratic states and that and that tug of war. Uh, that's what I'm seeing here is, dem- you know, I remember Vietnam, the one of the the, the rationales for Vietnam is you had to stop the domino theory of communism taking over in the Southeast Asia. Um, that might be taking place now is the alignment of allies uh, or axis, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I also think my last thought is that um, before there's a full fledged invasion of uh, Gaza is that, as Gene said properly and, and rightly so, is that um, they're not wearing uniforms. All, how do you differentiate between uh, you know an innocent citizen of Gaza versus a Hamas uh, agent of chaos and terrorism? And you know, there is no distinction. You can't tell. And so there is the problem. Unless unless Israel somehow has pre-identified uh, a bad actor of uh, Hamas, um, an invasion of ground troops isn't going to ferret them out. And so how do you cut the head off? a terrorist, terrorist organization when they can easily infiltrate back into a civilian population. Yeah, I want to mention a, a, a news clip I saw on one of those um, cable news channels. And it was, um, first it was a story about how the Israelis were dropping leaflets into northern Gaza, in which there are still hundreds of thousands of people who hadn't moved south and don't have any intention to move south. And um, so they had some footage. It's interesting how many cameras. They got so many cameras uh, in Gaza. It's like a PR machine. Everything that happens, and some of it is acted out. Um, anyway, they had this guy, and he, he picked up uh, a leaflet from the ground that had just been dropped by an Israeli plane. And um, he said, no way. I mean, it was a translation. No way. Uh, we aren't leaving. This is our home. We hate the Jews. We're going to stay here. And uh, so, I mean, query, is he Hamas or is he Palestinian? Or is the line between the two of them blurred? I'm going to I'm going to uh, give you the last word, Gene, if you don't mind. Uh, give me a short summary of everything we have discussed. The PR war and what it means in terms of actual consequences. Is it getting worse? Are we managing chaos or is chaos managing us? Secondly, what can we do about it? And how can we combat it? Because it depends on rhetorical inflammation, which we are seeing in our own country with protests against Jews and in our opinion pages, and also in our allies' interviews, such as the BBC, uh, presenting only one side of the story or accepting information which is tainted because it comes from sources which are not reliable, who have the intent of using information as a weapon, where they are weaponizing information. Thirdly, what can we learn from our past that we can employ now? By making the proper analogy, and I'm not saying that World War III is a fact right now. I'm not saying that we we could call it World War III, but we can analogize from World War II how we learned to, to fight back. And we can analogize from our recent World War on Terror how we can fight back against an asymmetrical enemy that is being utilized by nation states to escape responsibility for what they have put in motion. Iran really is the supplier and supporter and planner for the so-called axis of resistance of four asymmetrical groups. Hamas, Hezbollah, um, the uh, front for the uh, liberation of Palestine and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And fourthly, we, we have to consider that this generation is being shocked for the first time by the wars in Ukraine and uh, Israel because they are so brutal. And that brutality 
has been forgotten over the 70 some years since World War II. But we have to remember that we have to counter misinformation with information. We have to utilize our powerful weapons in a geopolitical way that says before there's a kinetic war, says to Iran, for example, don't stand back, don't get involved. So it's a it's a multi-front war. We have to keep that in mind. We have to not dis entangle Ukraine from Israel, and we might expect more hot wars to break out in sensitive areas as well. It's not, it's not a, 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 a pleasant scenario. <laughs> it's a very threatening scenario, but I invite anyone uh, who wants to look at the future to go back and study World War II because that was pretty threatening too. And we did prevail. Okay, we gotta go. Gene Rosenfeld, a scholar, historian, researcher, and Tim Epicella, co-host and student of global affairs. Thank you so much, Gene, Tim. We'll see you next time. Aloha. Aloha.